Hi, this is Zivi Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And speaking of books, I have two of my own books coming out this spring and summer. Princess Charming is a picture book, which debuts on April 19th, and Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature comes out on July 1st, and it is truly a labor of love. I hope you'll pre-order, order, order, and join me on tour as I go across the country. You can find out more at zibbyowens.com or bookendsmemoir.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens because I always post about everything. Enjoy the show. Jodi Picot is the author of Choice, which is an Audible original. Jodi is also the author of 27 novels with 40 million copies sold worldwide. Her last 13 books have debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Five novels have been made into movies, and four more, A Spark of Light, The Book of Two Ways, Small Great Things, and Wish You Were Here, are currently in development. Between the Lines, co-written, this is a play, Between the Lines, co-written with daughter Samantha Van Leer, has been adapted as an off-Broadway musical debuting this June. And by the way, I am taking 60 women to cocktails and drinks with Jody and her daughter and the two composers of the show as part of my Moms Don't Have Time to events. And then we are all walking across the street and seeing the play on at 8 p.m. on June 16th. There are a few tickets left that I am that you have to buy the tickets, which are $55 each. We got a great group rate. And they're almost all gone. But if you Email info at zibbyowens.com, especially after listening to this episode, you can potentially get one of the remaining tickets and come to my party and then the show with all of us. Uh, This is just the first, well, it's really the second after Candace Bushnell's event at the Carlisle of many events that I hope to do with our amazing Moms Don't Have Time to community and to stay up to date on all of this and get first dibs on special events, you should subscribe to my newsletter, which you can find on zibbyowens.com. Back to the bio, by the way. Jody is the recipient of multiple awards, including the New England Best Bookseller Award for Fiction, the Alex Award from the YA Library Services Association, and the New Hampshire Literary Award for Outstanding Literary Merit. She is also the co-librettist for the musical Breathe, which premiered in 2021, and of the musical adaptation of The Book Thief, which will premiere in the UK in 2022. Oh my gosh, I loved The Book Thief. Her next novel, Mad Honey, written with Jennifer Finney Boylan, who, by the way, I just saw speak at the Penn Gala. Sorry, this bio is all over the place. Will be published on October 4th, 2022. She lives in New Hampshire with her husband. Welcome, Jody. Thank you so much for coming back on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss some very exciting new work of yours. I can't wait to talk about all of it. Zibi, it is an honor to be back here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Okay. First things first. You <laughs> wrote as you and in the introduction to this piece, you explain that you've been coping with everything in your life through writing, which I completely relate to. By the way, <laughs> I can't do short stories like this, just whipping them out in this magic like you did. But you wrote this short story called Choice in response yes. to the Roe v. Wade news of late, and it is now out as an Audible original. Tell listeners what your piece is about and about and how you structured it, how it, how you just sure. got it done. <laughs> so Choice is a, a short, it's 38 minutes, and it's a short story basically that's set in a world where cisgender men and boys suddenly and inexplicably begin waking up pregnant. And it's kind of told through the lens of an ex-couple that experiences an unwanted pregnancy in a post-row America where it's the guys who are getting pregnant. And, you know, the idea for this, I wouldn't say it was an idea that really came to me. I was burning with fury when I heard about the the leak and the the case uh, about uh, the Dobbs case. And honestly, I think a lot of women really have been, and we've been shouting into the void and it just feels like, what, what can you do? What can you do to move a needle, to make a difference when this looks like a a done deal, a fait accompli. It's something that I warned was going to happen way back in 2018 when I wrote A Spark of Light. And everyone said, oh, you're overreacting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not overreacting, (laughs) you know, but I wanted to really do something. And then I I happened to listen in to some weird news clip about two male congressmen trying to discuss what an IUD was and how (laughs) it worked. And I realized these guys have absolutely no clue about a female body, about what it means to move through the world as a woman. 
And that's what kind of got me thinking about writing this piece. And literally, I, I went up to my husband. I said, I have to go upstairs now and do some rage writing. And that's what I did. I sat down and I just blew this piece out like in, in one single night. You know, for me, I really wanted to channel my stress and my anger and my frustration. And that's what writing did for me. But I also just really needed to, I, I needed to create something that would let other people feeling the same way I did feel that they were seen because right now we're being erased. And I, I wanted I wanted something that got out to a lot of people widespread. I was very, very fortunate because Audible read a, a text version of the story and immediately they were all over it. They wanted to do this. They wanted to get it out. They were willing to release it as an Audible original for free. And they knew that I was planning to donate every every cent I got paid to the National Network of Abortion Funds, which creates opportunities for termination, in, particularly for, for people in states where it's it's highly restricted or banned. And they, I'd like to think that they paid me a lot because of that. You know, I, <laughs> I think they kind of did. I think they were like, okay, she's, she's given something with a lot of zeros away here. And, you know, that made me feel great because I was, I was helping frustrated women be seen. I was hopefully taking payment that I was given and making a huge donation to an organization that's doing the work on the ground, boots on the ground. And I hope also convincing people who listen to this story that they should do the same in their small corner of the world, or if they live in a place where abortion access isn't going to be restricted, find a place where it is and, you know, really put, put your money where your mouth is. It's really unthinkable that this is happening. I, like, I cannot wrap my mind around this. It's like, you know, it, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's unthinkable and it's insidious mm -hmm. and it's dishonest and disingenuous, you know, to be told over and over, well, you know, we're just speaking for those who can't speak. And, you know, this is, this is about being pro-life. Well, you know, it's not pro-life. If it was about being pro-life, then the people who are against abortion would be for contraception and against gun uh, and for gun control and against the death penalty. And we all know that's rarely the case. It's not really about being pro-life. It's about it's about rendering women to be powerless. And part of, of writing this piece was to remind us, oh, well, we're not powerless yet. We've got a pretty, pretty mighty weapon. And that's a pen, you know, among other things. I just think uh I remember going back to this when I was writing a spark of light and saying, the question should never be at what point does a fetus become a person? The question should be at what point does the woman stop being one? Mm. Right. And, you know, if you want to give bodily autonomy to an embryo, to a fetus, great. I, I am absolutely willing to hear you out. Do it without taking bodily autonomy away from from the carrier, from the, the person who's pregnant. And, and then let's talk. I mean, it was so interesting the way you wrote it in the story, like men feeling like they just have a tumor or something like right. that and how, and how right. the news anchor like could not even say it. And you, right. you did it work, in a right. way where, and you did such a good job of this in your last book too, which focused on the pandemic, right? This is the same that you referenced the pandemic right away. So already we're like rooted in time. Like here we are, it's actually right now. <laughs> and, right. and the newscasters are like, you know, it looks like suddenly men are waking up and they can't even say it. And the other guy's like pregnant. <laughs> right. It's not a swear word. Right. Yeah, right. Says, right. Well, and, and it was really fun to sit down. I made a list actually, when I was writing it of all the tropes that I wanted to cover, you know, I wanted to make sure that, that this, this guy in the story, whose name is James, hears all the things and experiences all the things that, that I did and that other women and trans men who are pregnant might, might experience when they are going through a pregnancy because because most guys they just really don't get it so everything from someone laying their hands on you a total stranger touching your belly or telling you horrible birth stories to watching yourself get passed over for a promotion even though that is technically illegal mm -hmm. because you know your company knows that you're going to have to take some time off who knows if you're going to come back if you're going to stay off after your parental leave you know to my favorite one of course is <laughs> when uh, James finally confirms his pregnancy, his doctor is female. It's a minute clinic. And he is just staring at this doctor and saying, I don't, 
I, I don't want this. What do I do? I don't want this. And without even looking up, she goes, well, you should have thought of that before you had sex. Which, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, have we not all heard that? And I have to tell you, Zibby, this is, I, I keep hammering this, my husband with this because I keep talking about it. But do, have you noticed that in this ridiculous cycle of news that we're in, no one is saying anything about the men involved in pregnancy. It's yeah. very clear this is a punishment for women, but there's not even accountability for men. You know, we have, we have laws that are being proposed in Southern states where a rapist family can force a woman to carry that child to term. And there isn't even accountability for the person who unwillingly, you know, made, this woman was unwillingly made pregnant, obviously. Uh, it, it's To me, it is absolutely vile mm -hmm. and a tremendous and glaring omission. You want to talk about getting rid of Roe? All right, let's put a law in the books first that says if someone becomes pregnant and they have to carry that baby, they do DNA testing, they figure out who the dad is wherever possible, and that person has to legally commit to 18 years of covering health insurance, child care subsidies, everything that a woman is going to be stuck with, you know, having an unwanted pregnancy, carrying that to term. It, it, to me, it, it's not just unthinkable. It is unconscionable. Mm -hmm. It is a tremendous step back into the dark ages, and it will have ramifications in the United States that nobody has even begun to consider. We're going to see the economy change. We're going to see women's rights be set back. We're going to, of course, see reversals legally of every other decision that was, you know, based on the privacy, right to privacy laws. So that does take you into contraception and gay marriage and, and even it's interracial marriage. I mean, where are we going to wind up if this is the first step? This is so depressing. I know. Need, I'm so sorry. I know. It's okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's just, I like to believe yeah. that there is a way to affect change when horrible right. things seem imminent. Right. I what know. is that? What? Yes, what of course, do, we right? can donate to the to any. And you vote that, you know, I got to tell you, too, this is one of the things I was happiest about when it went to Audible. A lot of people who are very podcast forward are younger. There are a lot of younger listeners who who get their news and who get their their content really from podcasts. And they love it. I mean, I know my kids all are obsessed with podcasts. And, you know, that is a group that needs to vote. And they can't say, oh, we didn't get Bernie. Oh, I'm not voting this year. That mm -hmm. doesn't work, you know? Right. Yeah. And I, I really feel like that is something that I hope this piece does. I hope that younger millennial Gen Y people who listen to this, this Audible original are reminded that they need to get out and physically vote if they want to affect change in the world. It's really, that's all we've got that's left to us at this point. Or we could all write more stories. <laughs> well, that's a stopgap measure. We still need to vote. <laughs> I didn't, I shouldn't have said or. I should have said and. And. And, yeah. and we can write. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Power yeah, of yeah, the yeah. pen continues. Totally. Right. <laughs> It'd actually be neat if you, like, if there was a whole series, right? Like you hand the metaphorical pen to the next author, like you tap the next writer yeah. and write another one. And then there becomes a whole series. I don't yeah, know. Can I pick someone? Yeah, you pick. Let's do it. Let's do it on this, on this podcast. Let's do it. Uh, I, I pick Margaret Atwood. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause I think she is, she's really good about, she, she's pretty good at predicting the future in her fiction mm -hmm. and the future's already happened. So I'd like her as a Canadian to unravel what's being done in America a little bit. I think she'd be brilliant. Okay. I mean, in some ways she already has. <laughs> Audible? Did you hear that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Audible can line up the people and then whoever right. writes the stories can come on my podcast. How about that? Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So on a lighter note, you also have yes. a show about to premiere. It's going into previews yes. very soon called Between the Lines. Yes. It's at the Second Stage Theater. And I am so excited. I'm bringing, I'm, I'm doing one of my moms don't have time to outings, which I'm trying to resurrect now that Things are back to normal-ish, sort of, a little bit. And bringing 60 women to come see your show. And so excited. Very excited. By the way, if people listening would like, there are some, a few tickets left. It's prior to this, they've only been available through my newsletter, which you should subscribe to at zibbyowens.com. But if you email info at zibbyowens.com, 
soon, you may be able to win one of the tickets. You still have to pay for the tickets, but I'm hosting a private cocktail party with Jody right here and her daughter and the two yep. amazing songwriters for the whole play. And we are going to have the most fun night ever on June, what is it? June 16th. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. So tell us, tell us all about the play. I'm so uh, excited for it. I, I can't even tell you how excited I am for this. This is actually the perfect antidote to our, the beginning of our yes. conversation because between the lines is a joy spot in a time and a world where we need some joy. And, you know, it's the story. It actually is a story that my daughter came up with. We co-wrote two novels, a, a series, a young adult series based off an idea that she had when she was 13. She called me up on a book tour. I was stuck in traffic in LA. So I'm sure you can relate to that. I can relate and, to that. <laughs> right? And so I'm sitting in traffic and she's like, mom, I think I have a really good idea for a book. And it's like, all right, let's hear it. And she said, well, what if every time you closed a book, the characters inside it had lives and personalities completely different from what they were in the book? And what if there was a teenage girl who was having a really rough time because her parents had gotten divorced. She was being bullied at school. She had to move. And she, like many, like many people, found solace in books, dove into a book, got lost in a book. But she was obsessed with a children's fairy tale because the prince who was illustrated in it was really hot and because <laughs> his circumstances really spoke to her. And then one day, he really does. And she finds out that he wants out of his story just as badly as she wants out of hers. And when we wrote... The, Sammy was 16 when the first book was published. And then we wrote the second one when she was in college. We stayed up. We did it by speakerphone from 10 o'clock to midnight every night. We were writing. <laughs> and, you know, after that was published, I was like, you know what? I don't think we're done. And I can't explain it except to say it sang. The story sang to me. And I really wanted to look into making it a musical through a very bizarre connection at Dartmouth College, I wound up meeting Daryl Roth. She told and, me this story. It's so funny. <laughs> and Daryl is like, not Daryl is a, a genius and, a, you know, acclaimed multiple Tony Award winning producer and one of the only female producers for Broadway. And I wrote to her and I said, hi, I'm going to do what people do for me all the time that I hate, which is, can you please help me and tell me how to do this in your business? And she basically you know, taught me the ropes of how to build something into a musical. And she said, you know, the first thing you need to do are find writers for the, the uh, songs. And so I was like, all right, well, I was told, you know, that Alan Menken would write my show, but it wouldn't be until like 2030 and I would have to pay him <laughs> lots and lots of money. So I said, well, I want to find like an up and coming team and it would be awesome to find two women. Well, I didn't know that was like finding two unicorns in the same room. And I actually wound up talking to the head of the BMI workshop, which is like a pipeline for new composers and songwriting teams, as well as to Bobby Lopez, who is well known for the Book of Mormon and Frozen. And they both came up with the same name, which is the team of Sam Sol and Anderson. I was like, all right, well, that's got to be a sign. When I met with Kate and Elisa, who are our composing team, I was blown away. They're two beautiful, smart, crazy talented young ladies. And they came to this meeting with the book completely marked up saying, we think this is a song and this is, it, it, it spoke to them, this book, because it's the story of a young girl. And that's not something that you see in musical theater very often. I literally just had this conversation with my, my uh, co-writer. I said, name for me the number of mother daughter shows that you've seen on Broadway that focus on a very real and complex relationship between a mother and a daughter. So other than Gypsy, which I would not say is a positive one, and Mamma Mia, which is a farcical one, I mean, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> well, not a do- I mean, there is a daughter in Dear Evan Hansen, right? Doesn't okay. count. Doesn't yeah. count. Okay. Because it's about Evan. What about the Heidi Chronicles? I know this is like taking me back. Oh, musical. Okay. Well, you know what? I won't play this game. You're obviously right. right. Okay. Well, that's because you can't. The answer is you can't. And that's because honestly, Broadway is not a very welcoming community for women or women's stories. There are two all-female songwriting teams for Broadway. I have worked with both of them. Both two. That's it. Just two. You know, there you can count on one hand the number of female producers there are. What I love about this story is that it is an empowerment story. It is about understanding that if you don't like the story you're in, you can write a new one. You are the engineer of your own life. And frankly, after the last two years, is there anyone who does not want to get themselves out of whatever story we were all stuck in? 
And I can tell you, it's not the monkeypox one that I want to fall into. <laughs> you know, I mean, the just the I think the the positivity in this story is such it's so joyful. It's a great love story. It is funny. It's a very funny, funny show, which I love. And it's been such a tremendous honor to work in a place that is ripe with women on its creative team. Our director, Jeff Calhoun, is not a woman, but he is brilliant. He directed Newsies, of course. Our book writer, Timothy McDonald, also not a woman, but so generous because he has asked Sammy and I to collaborate. So the three of us are the ones who have been crafting all the words that are spoken during the show and organizing it. And it was devastating in 2020 when we were two weeks away from opening our rehearsals. And we found out, of course, that Broadway had shut down. And I honestly, I have never in my life experienced such depression. It wrecked me because Broadway is a long game. And to have spent so many years in development and then to have all that fall away, it was heartbreaking. And now we're all in this room. We just started rehearsals this week. And we're all looking around going, I think this happened for a reason. Mm -hmm. Because the cast that we have now is by far the best cast we've ever had. I, uh, The talent is off the charts. Ariel Jacobs and Julia Murney had everyone in tears yesterday doing a scene. Uh, Jake David Smith is going to be, he's going to have a million girls and boys falling in love with him because he is a dreamboat and his voice is insane. And, you know, it is it is a delightful, delightful cocoon of joy. That's really what it feels like in the room because we're all so excited and privileged to be there. And we know we're telling a story that needs to be told right now. Not just one about taking the reins of your own narrative, but one about, let's bring this full circle, women mattering and women's stories mattering. All of a sudden, this has sort of taken on a whole new cast for me because I think it's really important that we remind the Broadway community that our stories matter just as much as those of Evan Hansen or any other young male coming of age story. And, you know, when you get right down to the nuts and bolts of this business, it's usually women who buy the tickets. So why aren't they allowed to see their hopes and dreams and fears and, and accomplishments on a stage? What about Annie? <laughs> well, Annie doesn't really have a mom, does she? I know, but it's like a, a young girl story. I mean, you've been hanging on to that. Um, I, I told you I was going <laughs> to. Mother, daughter, mother, okay, daughter. You know what? Come see the preview <laughs> and then circle back with me. You'll see what I mean. I'm it's sure that like, you know, like every mom no. and daughter. I mean, look, Sammy and I wrote this book sitting side by side. Do you know how hard that is with a teenager? You know, yes. and it was fantastic yes. and also really hard. And I think that's that's in there. You know, mothers and daughters have a specific kind of tension because you know you're trying to separate from your mother, but you always wind up becoming her somehow. Yep. And, <laughs> and yeah. so I think that that finding the common ground between them for Delilah and Grace in the story is something that every woman in the audience is going to experience. I know that when we debuted this in Kansas City seven years ago, we had people come see the show and then they would come back three or four more times. They would bring their mothers and then they would bring their daughters. We had grown men who were like, it was the strangest thing. It was grown men who were like contractors and, you know, like, like just not the kind of guys you would imagine seeing a musical would come out at intermission, sobbing in the lobby to say, I am Delilah. This is this is who I was growing up. And I was like, yeah, I felt like we were doing therapy sessions in the lobby. Oh my <laughs> the show. It was just a really cathartic and joyous, you know, experience. It, you leave, you will leave the theater feeling better than you did when you walk in. And I'm so sorry in advance, but you will never get the songs written by Samsel Anderson out of your head. I told them when they started writing for us, I would like you to out Disney Disney. Amazing. And they did. And as a matter of fact, on the strength of their songs for Between the Lines, they were hired by Disney. Oh. And then Central Park, they were the, they're the staff songwriters for Central Park and Apple. Wow. Just really talented ladies. Well, I have to say, when Daryl told me what this play was about, I was like, you know, I my parents got divorced when I was 14. And I did oh. lose myself in books. And I just wrote this whole memoir, Bookends, about that whole experience and falling into books. And I'm always talking on this podcast about like, well, but what if that character 
jumped into mm-hmm. that book. Like, what if what if they right. all like could have a new book about them? So anyway, I was like, yeah. this is going to be my favorite play ever. I have to do something. I cannot wait. I am so excited. I'm so glad you're coming. I and, can't and wait. it is. It's like we all have literary crushes, right? That was yeah. why I wanted to write this with Sammy because she came up with a great idea. Yeah. And you awesome. know, what if your literary crush actually showed up? What if I I opened that door and Mr. Darcy is standing behind it? I don't know. Maybe it could happen. I haven't given up hope yet. <laughs> Wait, so who is the hot guy that you then cast in this play? So in our show? Yeah. Yeah. So Prince Oliver, who is the uh, the hot illustrated prince, is played by Jake David Smith. He was previously in Frozen. And wait, here's a great story. He was cast two weeks before we were supposed to open our rehearsals in 2020. So he was cast in early March of 2020. And most of us were not there. I think Jeff was there and Tim Tim was there, our book writer and our director. They both had COVID but didn't know it. So nobody remembered Jake's audition. Oh my gosh. (laughs) They were so sick. And then when we finally all got to meet Jake and hear him sing and see him act, we were all just like, are you kidding me? I mean, this guy is, this is a star turn. And, you know, he will be able to forever say, I think that he was, you know, this changed his life because I really think it will. I just hope we can stage tour by then because there'll be lots of screaming people there wanting to take pictures with him and have autographs. I can't wait. And then I'll have to come back another time and bring my daughter and my mother. Yeah, you will. See, you're going to. come back. I know. I can already feel it. I can feel it. Anyway, what an interesting range of topics (laughs) affecting change, uniting women. I mean, it's really amazing harnessing the power of this sort of collective in all these different ways. So say again, Jody, where you are donating the funds from Audible if people want to join you in that. Yeah. So I'm donating to the National Network of Abortion Funds. What they do is they have partner funds in states like Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and Texas, where it's particularly difficult for women and those who become pregnant to have access to abortion care. And they provide not just funds, but literal vans and transportation and housing if you need to get out of those states to have an abortion. So as you can imagine, when Roe falls, their work is going to be even more important than ever. And that was why I chose to, to give the money to them. And I, I encourage if, if you can make a difference, if you have a little extra cash, everything that you can donate to a fund like that, whether it's a local fund for you or a national network, Planned Parenthood, any of those organizations that are doing the work and supporting women, you know, they're going to become critical for all of us. And you know, it, it, to touch on what you said, I never thought to put these two topics together between the lines and, and choice, but but this is about women supporting each other and a community of people who can become pregnant supporting each other and each other's right to decide when that should happen. Yep. And that is the one thing that they can't ever take away from us. Mm-hmm. We historically have banded together and we have moved mountains yep. and we'll do it again. Amazing. Well, I will put the donation link in the show notes. And Thank also, you. you know, again, if people want to be invited to the special cocktail party, get the discount rate, email on June 16th in New York City. It's email info at zibbyowens.com. And thank you. This, this, this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. I will see you on the 16th. Zibby, thank you. <laughs> you're just a light in the world. I can't wait to see you. And I know you're going to love the show. I can't wait. I know I am too. I'm already sad. I'm already sad. It's almost over. Okay. You're going to cry. You're going to laugh. It's going to be great. Awesome. All right. Good <laughs> luck with your rehearsals. Bye. Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you like this podcast, you will love my new anthology called Moms Don't Have Time to Have Kids. Check it out, and you'll hear from 49 authors about all sorts of things moms don't have time to do. All the authors have been on this podcast. Also, check out my TikTok, at with Zibby and Tracy, my other podcast, Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy. Check out Moms Don't Have Time to Write on Medium. And of course, my new publishing company called Zibby Books. And now back to our daily author interview site and a quick hello from some of my kids. Hi. Hi. Hello. Enjoy the show. Hi.